begin. Good morning. It is September 15th and Bill Dad continues to have some thoughts about Job's life. And Bill Dad, the Shua replied, dominion and awe belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Can his force be numbered on whom does his light not rise? How can a mortal be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? Even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes. How much less a mortal who is a maggot, a human being who is only a worm. Job replied, how have you helped the powerless? How have you saved the arm that is feeble? What advice have you offered to one without wisdom? And what great insight have you displayed? Who has helped you utter these words? And whose spirit from your mouth? Whose spirit spoke from your mouth? The dead are in deep anguish, whose depth of the water and all that live in them, the realm of the dead is naked before God. Destruction lies uncovered. He spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. He wraps up the waters in his cloud, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. He covers the face of the moon full, the full moon, spreading his clouds over it. He marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for the boundary between light and darkness. The pillar of the heavens quake, aghast at his rebuke. By his power, he churned up the sea. By wisdom, he cut Rahab to pieces. By his breath, the skies became fair. His hand pierced the gilded, the gliding serpent. And these are but the outer fringe of his works. How faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then can understand the thunder of his power? And as and, and Job continued his discourse. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice? The Almighty who has made my life bitter? As long as I have life within me and breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not say anything wicked, and my tongue will not utter lies. I will never admit that you are right till I die. I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my innocence and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. May my enemy be like the wicked, my adversary like the unjust. For what hope have the godless when they are cut off, when God takes away their life? Does God listen to their cry when distress comes upon them? Will they find delight in the Almighty? Will they call upon God at all times? I... I will teach you about the power of God. The ways of the Almighty will not conceal. You have seen, you have, you have all seen this yourself. Why then this meaningless talk? Here is the fate God allots to the wicked. The heritage, if, a heritage a ruthless man receives from the Almighty. However many his children, the fate of his sword his offspring will never have enough to eat. The plague will bury those who survive him, and their widows will not weep for them. Though he heaps up silver like dust and clothes like piles of clay, he will lay up the righteous will wear, and the innocent will divide his silver. The house he builds is like a moth's cocoon, a hut made by a watchman. He lies down wealthy, but will do so no more. When he opens his eyes, all is gone. Terrors overtake him like a flood. A tempest snatches him away in the night. The east wind carries him off and he is gone. It sweeps him out of his place. It hurls itself against him without mercy and he flees headlong from its powers. It claps its hands in desertion and hisses uh, him out of his place. There is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron takes from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Mortals put an end to the darkness. They search out the furthest recesses. 
for or in the blackest dark darkness from human dwellings, they cut a shaft in places untouched by human feet. Far from other people, they dangle and sway. The earth from which food comes is transformed below as by fire. Lu Lepes Leuzi, Le I have it. how do you say Lazuli? that? Lazuli. Lapis Lazuli. Comes from its rocks. Is that blue? Is Lapis Lazuli blue? I think it's a- It's, a, it's either a blue or a green, I think. Well, it comes from its rocks and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No bird of prey knows what is hid, that hidden path. No falcon's eyes has seen it. Proud beasts do not set foot on it and no lion prowls there. People assault the flinty rock with their hands and lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock. Their eyes see all its treasures. They search the sources of the rivers and they bring hidden things to light. But where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? All of that to set up these two questions, right? No mortal comprehends its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me. The sea says, it is not in me. It cannot be bought with the finest gold, nor can its price be weighed out in silver. It cannot be brought, bought with gold, of Orpher and precious onyx and lapis lazuli. Neither gold nor crystal can compare with it, nor can it be had for jewels of gold. Coral and jasper are not worthy of mention, and the price of wisdom is beyond rubies. Topaz of Kush cannot compare with it. It cannot be bought with pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? It is hidden from the eyes of every living thing, concealed even from the birds in the sky. Destruction and death say, only a rumor of it has reached our ears. God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells, for he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he established the force of the wind and measured out the waters, when he made a decree for the rain and a path for the thunderstorm, then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it, and he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. How I long for the months gone by, for the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone on my head, and by his light I walked through darkness. Oh, for the days when I was in my prime, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house, when the Almighty was still with me and my children were around me, when my path was drenched with cream and the rock poured out for me streams of olive oil. When I went to the gate of the city and took my seat in the public square, the young men saw me and stepped aside and the old men rose to their feet. The chief men refrained from speaking and covered their mouths with their hands. The voices of the nobles were hushed and their tongues stuck to the roof of their mouths. Whoever heard me spoke well of me, and those who saw me commended me, because I rescued the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to assist them. The one who was dying blessed me. I made the widow's heart sing. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. I thought, I will die in my own house, my days as numerous as the grains of sand. My roots will reach to the water, and the dew will lie all night on my branches. My glory will not fade, the bowl will, never be, will ever be new in my hand. People listened to me expectantly, waiting in silence for my counsel. After I had spoken, they spoke no more. My words fell gently on their ears. They waited for me as for showers and drank in my words as the spring rain. When I smiled at them, they scarcely believed it. The light of my face was precious to them. I chose the way for them and sat as their chief. I dwelt as a king among his troops. I was like one who comforts mourners. But now they mock me, men younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to put with my sheepdogs. Of what use was the strength of their hands to me since their vigor had gone from them? Haggard from want and hunger, they roamed the parched land in desolate wastelands at night. In the brush they gathered salt herbs, and their food was the root of the broom brush. 
They banished from human society, shouted at as if they were thieves. They were forced to live in the dry stream beds among the rocks and in holes in the ground. They brayed among the bushes and huddled in the undergrowth. A base and nameless brood, they were driven out of the land. And now these young men mock me in song. I have become a byword among them. They detest me and keep their distance. They do not hesitate to spit in my face now that God has unstrung my bow and afflicted me. They throw off restraint in my presence. On my right, the tribe attacks. They lay snares for my feet. They build their siege ramps against me. They break up my road. They succeed in destroying me. No one can help him, they say. The advance is through a gaping breach amid the ruins they come rolling in. Terrors overwhelm me. My dignity is driven away as by the wind. My safety vanishes like a cloud. And now my life ebbs away. Days of suffering grip me. Night pierces my bones. My gnawing pains never rest. In his great power, God becomes like clothing to me. He binds me like the neck of my garment. He throws me into the mud and I am reduced to dust and ashes. I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. With the might of your hand, you attack me. You snatch me up and drive me before the wind. You toss me about in the storm. I know you will bring me down to death to the place appointed for all the living. Surely no one lays a hand on a broken man when he cries for help in his distress. Have I not wept for those in trouble? Has, my, has not my soul grieved for the poor? Yet when I hoped for good, evil came. When I looked for light, then came darkness. The turning inside me never stops. Days of suffering confront me. I go about blackened, but not by the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. I have become a brother of jackals, a companion of owls. My skin grows black and peels. My body burns with fever. My lyre is tuned to mourning and my pipe to the sound of wailing. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman, but what is our lot from God above, our heritage from the Almighty on high? Is it not ruin for the wicked, disaster for those who do wrong? Does he not see my ways and count my every step? I have walked with falsehood, or my foot has hurried after deceit. Let God weigh me in honest scales, and he will know that I am blameless. If my steps have turned from the path, if my heart has been laid, led by my eyes, or if my hands have been defiled, then may others eat what I have sown, and may my crops be uprooted. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then may, by, may, may my wife grind another man's grain, and may, another, and may other men sleep with her, for that would have been wicked, a sin to be judged. It is a fire that burns to destruction. It would have uprooted my harvest. If I have denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? If I have denied the desires of the poor, or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my mouth I reared them as a father would, and from my birth I guided the widow, if I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing, or the needy without garments, and their hearts did not bless me, for warming them with the fleece from my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder. Let it be broken off at the joint, for I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of his splendor, I could not do so, such things. If I have put my trust in gold, or say to pure gold, you are my security, if I have rejoiced over my great wealth, the fortune my hands had gained, if I have regarded the sun in its radiance, or the moon moving in splendor, so that my heart was secretly enticed. And my hand offered them a kiss of homage. Then these also would be sins to be judged, for I would have been unfaithful to God on high.
If I have rejoiced at my enemy's misfortune or gloated over the trouble that came to him, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by invoking a curse against their life. If those of my household have never said, who has not been filled with Job's meat? But no stranger had to spend the night in the street, for my door was always open to the traveler. If I have concealed my sin as people do by hiding my guilt in my heart, because I so feared the crowd and so dreaded the contempt of the clans that I kept silent and would not go outside, oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I would put it on like a crowd, crown. I would give him an account of my every step. I would present it to him as a ruler. If my land cries out against me and all its furrow are wet with tears, if I have devoured it, its yield without payment or broken the spirit of its tenants, then let briars come up instead of wheat and stinkweed instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. <laughs> I, I am done talking. That's enough. <laughs> well, you know, I noticed uh, a few times there my internet kind of froze up and I, and I happen to think it's because teachers all over this great state are logging on to the internet right now and uh, perhaps slowing things down a bit. But there was a, a moment where it froze for me, and I don't know if it froze for anybody else, but you were reading, Steve, early on, uh, uh, and it talked about how, you know, should, uh, should my wife grind another man's grain as kind of the, <laughs> the, the, the payment of, of sin? <laughs> and Glenn picked up on it, I noticed. And, uh, man, I thought... How, how bad would it be in my life right now if God's consequence for me is that Elizabeth had to go grind somebody else's grain? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what all that means exactly or what that meant for them. But, but I know for a fact my life wouldn't be worth mud if, if that was God's consequence on my life. <laughs> I, you know, the rest I of it is all kind of in comparison then. That, uh, what that might look like, but pretty. I pretty had to do a double text. take on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did you guys see in the in the text that you want to underscore before we look at questions? Anything? Uh, you know, it's just interesting, Mark, and maybe we'll come back to it later. But you know, right above uh, where the the verse there went, when Job, um, what he makes that comment about, I, I sign my defense. Yeah. Let God answer me now. Yeah. Think that's, you know, that's pretty bold. Right. Say, okay, okay. All right, God, here you go. Here you go. Here's my signet ring. Here's my stamp. Here's my word. Here's my, my signature. I am declaring this to be truthful. I raise my, my right hand and. and pretty bold. Where? Yeah. Bold I like how. I like how Job defends his righteousness too, and and right in right out of the gate, Bildad, you know, replies, "Well, can anybody be righteous? You know, can people actually live a righteous life?" And uh, and Job kind of defends it, yeah, very well. Well, and then we got to the part uh, on the about the six page end, Todd, where. You know, I had kind of teed up in my reading. The beginning of wisdom was the fear of the Lord. And uh, that brought me in my mind back to when we were reading Proverbs. And Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Kind of a, a powerful construct that we wound up spending a lot of time kind of pressing through in the early part of the spring when we were in that section of scripture kind of what does that mean to to have a, a healthy reverent awe of god what does that mean to view him as high as we ought and to let other things in our lives pale in comparison in our thinking in our posturing um and it feels as though Job has kind of struck that same chord of saying, wait a second, 
the, the real reason that I can stand with a righteousness has to do with the way that I think about who God is and how I have ordered my life in relationship to that. Pretty powerful. Yeah. And then, and then that answer, that answer, you know, the, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom and to shun evil is understanding. So what, so what, right. is, so what is wisdom and what is understanding? Fearing the Lord oh. and turning away from evil. Those two things. Yeah. And then that's the, that's the wise and the, the action related to that wisdom. It's like, it's one thing to, to know something. It's another thing to act on what you know. I think a lot of people can get halfway there sometimes where it's like, I know, I know that I know that I know. Um, but taking that step of, of moving into action is uh, pretty great that they paired that together. And, and, and in a sense, it, it's so simple. I was just going to say, it's, it's so simple, right? I mean, when it, when it really kind of comes down to, you know, we, I'm guilty of complicating things a lot of the time. That's pretty simple. Fear the Lord, turn from evil. You're good. You know, it's, it's so interesting, though, because if, if, if when we boil it down, it, it, it is nothing really in Scripture usually is hard to do. It's just easy not to do. How would you summarize Job's approach to life, both before and after the onset of his troubles? He, he had a uh, good realization of where he was at in relation to God, God, the creator of the universe. Uh, and, and he, all the way through Job so far, we've read, you know, in good, bad, and ugly, he's still God's creation, still God's servant. And, and the sooner you get to that realization, the better life will be. Mm -hmm. Sherry said, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. I think there's a, a real wisdom in kind of ordering our life that way. It's a little tricky sometimes because there are some moral complexities to life that make it hard to know what is the best when uh, two bad choices or, you know, evaluating things that are obviously not going to be godly, but one's going to be less godly. You know, it's uh, it, it comes down to oftentimes a layer of complexity that makes uh, this a lot more difficult. But as a general rule, if you can bring that filter into your life, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. If that yeah, can be Glenn your, and Bob, your modus operandi. Glenn and Bob both uh, both responded. Uh, you know, he had confidence and he was still humble. You know, jo Job had his values straight and. You know, Job is describing what his life was like before the onset of his troubles. His door was wide open. Travelers did not stay out on the street. You know, he, he had food for everybody. He was feeding, feeding the, the poor and all of that stuff. And, uh, you know, that, that's a good, I love me a good man who can do that mm -hmm. and still walk confident and have, have an authority to him you know, it, it's a good spot to be in well and it, and it seemed as though he had a real heart of charity too i mean he mm -hmm. was you know in in spite of how important he appeared to be to other people he still held on to those um you know the, those beliefs of needing to help the needy you know the the widows the you know, I, I, yeah he's walking around as as you know how did he put it you know i'm like a king amongst my my warriors and people stand up when i walk into a room and and yet my hand is open to taking care of the people in need so how do you think job let his circumstances shape his perception of his life i mean maybe it was there's both a uh, a pre and a post event but how do you how do you imagine he allowed some of these ideas that he had filter into how he was living. Now, I wonder if it comes back a little bit to, um, you know, he was, I, maybe he was aware of just how blessed he really was. And, and because of that, he, he also had that heart of, of humility that, that allowed him to give into other people's lives. He, he had the recognition that, that he's been blessed. And so he wants to be a blessing to, or felt, felt compelled maybe, to be a blessing to others. Steve? Yeah, and when God is his constant, so he's he's gone through the good and he's gone through the bad. And so yes, he, he definitely didn't let the good times kind of outweigh the bad times as he relates to his God. 
Um, and so he's, he's established God as the constant of, of who he needs to identify in, in the good and the bad. So how has that flushed out in your life, gentlemen? I mean, what significant events in your life have helped shape the view of life and, and really the view of God that you hold? You know, when, when I've, I, Mark, I don't know that I can I think of specific events, but I do think of people that, that, have, um, that have entered into my life at, at various times um, that, that have really helped to shape you know, my life and my faith, um, and not necessarily in the same. I mean, I've got people who I think have helped shape my life, and I've got people that have helped shape my faith. They're not necessarily always the same people, but I can, I can look in my past to a number of, of significant people that have um, had an influence on me as far as how you ought to live your life. And, and um, you know, I think fondly about, you know, teachers and coaches in high school and college. Um, you know, I think about uh, college classmates of mine that had significant impact on my faith back at a time when um, I, I was not necessarily headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And I think I've shared some of those stories. But, but for me, I don't th know that I can come up with specific events, but I can definitely think of people. Yeah, and I, I've had the privilege, you know, with a grandfather as a pastor and, and my dad was a missionary. And so I knew the word of God, you know, and, and grew up learning it quite a bit, but I do recall, you know, growing up, I've learned that I learned that, you know, this Christian walk is a job. It's a chore. Uh, you know, that's what, that's what my grandpa does. That's what my dad does. It never really related personally with me. And it wasn't until college that, I chose to go to St. Cloud State, one of the most liberal schools in the nation. And um, and that's where I had the pivotal, I need to really focus and, and, and meet Christ for the first time almost. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that was the pivotal moment. And I think I can describe it with, with, uh, with how Job did. Job defined Christ as his anchor. You know, that's what, that's what was first and foremost in, in every part of his life. And that's what I had to do as well, is anchor my life in the knowledge of who Christ is and, and my relationship with him. Where, where did you uh, uh, come to actually accept Christ? I know you said you were at St. Cloud State, but was it, was it in just a, a church service? Was it talking across the table with a friend? Was it at an uh, event of some sort? How did that happen for you, Steve? Where, no, I, it, where the penny dropped? I always describe that I, I did accept Christ with my mom in the kitchen at, at five. Yeah. You know? And so, but no, I was, I was actually just walking one day, kind of frustrated with, you know, what was going on in school and whatnot. And I was just, I was kind of alone in the middle of the student union, if that makes sense. So I was in my own mind, sitting on a couch, everything's chaos around me. And I'm having this conversation with God, you know, and, uh, and, and just, all right, God, I give up. I'm, I'm done trying to do this my own way. I'm done trying to do this, you know, with Steve Wright's plan. Hmm. And, uh, and I just had that conversation and I've had several of these conversations with him. I give it up. I'm going to let you control. And, and boy, does things change after that. They wow. really do. Where was it for you, Todd? Where, where did it, I mean, was it event oriented? Was it you just hanging out by yourself in a student union building or well, where, did, <laughs> where did the, where did the real, I mean, the real penny drop experience happen? So the, the first experience was when I was in junior high and I think I may have shared, uh, uh, it happened at a, at a movie, uh, a, a movie called A Time to Run. And uh, it was a Billy Graham crusade movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the, after the movie, they had, a, they had an altar call. Uh, so walked down to the front of the theater and, and uh, prayed with the- uh, That with wasn't the, one of those black and white silent films, was it? Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, sorry, really emotional moment. Now here I come. <laughs> yeah, 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 thanks, all right. Uh, but, but, I, but that I do remember and then, um, 
when I was in college, I, I had kind of uh, drifted a little bit, and, and uh, I had a, a college teammate of mine who was a strong believer, grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and took me to church, and, and where I was able to kind of renew uh, my faith at that time. And, and since then, since that point in time, um, you know, the path has, has been pretty, pretty clear at, after that point. So I actually had a couple of different moments. How do you think our self-esteem is affected by our achievements and our failures? Probably more than it should be. And I, and I say that because if, if, I, if my feeling of worth is based on any achievement that I, that I gain or any failure that I have, my, my, my life's going to do a lot of this, right? Because there are plenty of ups and downs but I would say that it's probably affected more than it, than it should be. Well, really? there's a lot of good stuff coming out in the chat right now. You know, it shouldn't affect our self-esteem at all. Our worth is given to us by God. That's why self-esteem is crucial, especially like I, like I just described with that moment in time at St. Cloud State. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on the couch and I'm actually identifying my self-esteem, but I'm not identifying it out of my own value and, and actually Job, you know, I, I'm amazed at how many words were uh, were given to the pursuit of gold, the pursuit of lapis lazuli, um, you know, all of those different minerals and things that we like to find on, on earth. Um, you know, but, but when we identify our esteem in God and being God's loved child, uh, you know, that, that carries you pretty far. Mm -hmm. And having that and building that self-esteem and that self, what the value of who you are as a human being, um, you know, that helps you in the achievement side and the failure side. When you, when you really understand your identity and your value, when, that, when those two things, your, your true value before God and your identity that's in him, there isn't really room for pride because pride is always a, somehow attached to our self-perceived confidence in our accomplishments or our achievements. And, uh, you know, and, and there's nothing to achieve in receiving a gift from God in relationship to his choosing to adopt you into his family. There's not, there's no, there's no real reason to walk with an extra spring in your step as if you did something. But there is something to be really excited about the fact that he did something. And, uh, uh, but there's also a recognition that he, he can and does offer that to everybody. So there's, it's not like I, I've got something that you can't have. I have something that you have very much available to you. So why would I be in myself walking in any sense of pride about that? I wish, as I've been reading in this story up until now, that God would have uh, at one point just whispered down and said, Hey, Joe, I just want you to understand what's about to happen to you. Um, you know, this is going to be really, really bad. No, I'm with you. No, I'm not forsaken you. And we're, we're going to see, see this through. Don't lose hope. Don't lose faith. Don't lose confidence. Hang on to the end. And I think sometimes it's hard even in our world today to remember that those things are true you know, and to anchor our lives into the truth of scripture where God has promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you to anchor our, our lives in the promise that our identity is in him, that we have been adopted. We have been purchased with a price and that whatever it is that you're facing today, uh, you're not facing it alone. He has in, infused you with his Holy spirit. And his intention is that as bad as today gets, or as, bad and as hard as this is in this season for you, uh, that you will make it through. And uh, I'm so grateful for the word of God because that is the agency with which God has whispered now truth into our lives about who we are and how we can navigate this thing. And for that, I'm really grateful and want to hang on to those realities as we, uh, as we step into what he has for us. So Father, I just thank you so much that you love us. I thank you that you have called us according to your purpose. And I ask, Lord, that we would be better stewards of that purpose, and we would walk well in what you have for us today, and that we would sense your presence, sense your Holy Spirit guiding us as we uh, navigate what's in front of us. Today, we offer this to you again in Jesus' name, and we ask that 
we would uh, we would walk with our faces like flint, that we would be steadfast in our pursuit of you and our love of others. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen and amen. Thanks you, thank, thank you, you Steve, for joining us today and yes, being part of you. this. Fun. And you guys have an awesome rest of your day. Have a good one, everyone. Blessings, gang. Bye-bye.